Cycle Talk TV is brought to you by Ducati, Kawasaki, KTM, Harley Davidson, On Two Wheels Motorsports, Polaris, Triumph, and Victory. Today on Cycle Talk TV, we test two Triumph Thunderbirds. We ride the Polaris Ute. We get out there on an XV1000 Classic. We check out electric superbike racing, and Chris even learns to ride a sidecar. Thunderbird. It's a classic name of motorcycles, cars and even a much-loved science fiction TV puppet show. But for Cycle Talk, Thunderbird means the biggest parallel twin in the world. The modern Triumph Thunderbirds. There are four in the range. Evoke power, comfort and grunt. From the first Thunderbird of 2009 to the bigger and more powerful Storm to the latest LT and Commander, the modern Thunderbird takes on the American V-Twins for grunt, style and big bike presence. What started as a 1600 grew to a 1700 with the Thunderbird Storm, a more aggressively styled and powered Thunderbird, and this year Triumph introduced the LT and Commander. The latest model is the $22,490 Commander, which I tested in the September issue of Cycle Talk, which you can still download via the iPhone and iPad app or from cycletalk.com.au, and it offers massive torque and plenty of power in a naked cruiser chassis with two tone paint and an interesting mix of classic style with modern touches. The guards, tank and seat are classically styled. The twin headlights, alloy wheels and fat tyres, thoroughly modern. The LT is the touring machine of the lineup, but it's a classical tourer with laced 16 inch wheels at both ends, an easily removed touring screen, leather bags and a pillion backrest on possibly the most comfortable touring seat ever made. Priced at $23,490, it's the most expensive Thunderbird, but the standard equipment list is long too and having weather protection and luggage capacity makes this Thunderbird the most versatile ever. You can download the June 2014 issue of Cycle Talk to read more about the bike. The Storm is a little out there, tough styling and the most potent motor. This is the Thunderbird for the petrol head, although none of the models are exactly short on power and torque. At $20,990 it offers a lot of horses per dollar. Cycle Talk first tested the Storm in the April 2011 issue, which you can still read online. The still available classic Thunderbird is still popular and you'll save a few bucks too, for it's the only T-Bird under 20k priced at $19,490. The engine's a bit smaller being a 1600 and the equipment level not quite as extensive as the newer machines, but that's in keeping with the lower price. Cycle Talk first tested the bike back in November 2009 and you can still read that online at cycletalk.com.au. Now we're going to have a little bit more detailed look at the Thunderbird LT and the Commander, both new bikes for 2014. Triumph Thunderbird LT, LT for light touring. This is a new model of Thunderbird. It's been significantly changed from other Thunderbirds that are still available. It's got a lower seat, a heavily padded seat, in fact triple layer foam inside the, pass inside the rider seat double layer foam in the passenger seat to make it even more comfortable when you're touring. Comes with a screen on the front. Now this particular bike fitted with an optional larger touring screen uh, to make it even more comfortable on those long runs. You can also pull the screen off in a matter of seconds to make it a bagger. The panniers can also be pulled off fairly quickly, there's only a couple of bolts holding them on if you don't need those panniers. This particular bike's also got the crash bars which are an option and the highway pegs which are an option. Designed for touring at, at highway sort of speeds and around that anything from 80 to 120 kilometers an hour. It's extremely comfortable and a lot of fun to ride. You really enjoy just cruising around, taking in the scenery. Footboards make it more comfortable, heel and toe gear change. Very nice machine to just cruise around on. The sixth gear is an over overdrive and you really know it. The revs are hardly ticking over when you're in top gear. Priced at well under $25,000, I think most people will see this bike as pretty good value. And the fact that you can switch it around from being a naked machine into a touring bike in a matter of a few minutes 
makes it uh, twice the value for money, almost. I've come up to Queensland for the launch of the Triumph Thunderbird Commander. It's a variant on the Thunderbird range, and there's quite a few differences between this machine and the LT. Starting with the wheels, these ones are cast alloy. 17 inch front, 16 inch rear, where the LT has 16s at both ends. The guards are also different, colours are different. This one obviously doesn't come with the screen or the uh, leather, leather saddlebags, and it's more of a cruiser than it is a tourer. There's detail changes as well, but the most significant things are really the handlebars offer a slightly different riding position, so they, it feels a little bit more comfortable in the breeze on the freeway than an LT without its screen. The headlights are also different. This has got the bug-eyed twin headlights. And overall, it's a very similar machine, but it does have its own personality. So it doesn't really matter in some ways which Thunderbird you choose. There's enough options and accessories to turn the bike into exactly what you want from the starting point of the four different models that Triumph offer. They all offer fuel injection, ABS, all those modern important things that you expect these days, but classic style, lots of grunt, and the ability to personalize it just the way you want. Check them out at your Triumph dealer. Today we're having a look at the Polaris Ute. Now the Ute is the latest in a long line of agricultural ATVs produced by the American manufacturer. Now with that history in Australia, Polaris decided to bring out their American engineers and find out what we needed in a machine to make it more rugged and suitable for Australia. Now the sort of things they looked at and introduced were sealing the drive shaft splines, the suspension bushings and the ball joints, which means that you get longer intervals between servicing and your machine is just going to last longer overall. Okay, so in addition to these mechanical features that were a big driver in the youth's development, Polaris have also got a lot of other features specifically designed for farmers to make it a good machine for using on the land. First of all, we've got a machine that can be registered straight off the factory showroom floor. We've got lights, we've got mirrors, we've got indicators, which is a great thing for occupational health and safety. It might not seem like a lot, but it means that it gives you confidence that you can go out and register this machine without having to go and fit any aftermarket products. In addition to these mechanical features, Polaris have come up with a whole host of other additions to make life easier for the man on the land. We've got things like a massive dump box on the back, 180 kilogram capacity. We've got a narrower seat. It makes it easier to get on and off for when you're working around the farm. 
and we've also got the new four-wheel descent control which makes it really reliable and easy to use going down very steep terrain. To really test them out though, we're going to take this for a ride and see how well they perform. Okay, so we've just spent a day on the Polaris Ute, and here's my thoughts on the features. I really like the seating position. It feels a little bit higher than on other quads, but it's more relaxed. You just don't have to put the effort into riding the machine that you normally would. The power steering is very direct and very light. I just don't think you're gonna get as tired after working for a day on a bike like this. Other things I liked were the descent control, very effective, really good on very steep sections. Probably the only thing I don't like about the Polaris quads is the gear shift. I'd probably like to see something that's got a gated selector rather than the lever. So all in all, I think Polaris is delivered with a very practical machine. The features are all useful and it definitely deserves the ute name. The Polaris Ute is powered by a single cylinder four stroke liquid cooled engine. It's priced at $9,995 and you can get more information from polarisindustries.com.au or your local Polaris dealer. Read Cycle Talk Magazine's October issue out now. On the cover are the 2015 model Harley Davidson Road Glide Special and the Sherco 300 SER, a big American tourer and a lithe French enduro machine. You can read the October issue in print from better bike shops across Australia on your computer or Android device through cycletalk.com.au in our PDF edition. But the best way to enjoy Cycle Talk is on an iPad or iPhone, which is everything in the print edition plus embedded video, slideshows and lots more pictures. And it's all free. Download the app from the App Store and then subscribe free and download back issues too. All of Cycle Talk's editions, electronic and print, are free. Check out more information on Cycle Talk on our website, cycletalk.com.au, and on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Everyone puts their pants on one leg at a time. What separates some of us, though, is what we throw a leg over after our pants are on. The new Harley Davidson Breakout Motorcycle. Breakout. Come down to On Two Wheels Motorsports, Sydney's best motorcycle shop and a proud sponsor of Cycle Talk TV. With a huge range of new Yamaha and Kawasaki motorcycles and ATVs, as well as a huge range of spares and all the accessories you're likely to need, On Two Wheels can help get you into the right bike at the right price with the right accessories and the right advice. On Two Wheels Motorsports, 304 Queen Street, Campbelltown. Find us online on social media or call us on 024625 7518. Until I was told everything about you And though I tried to hide My smile gets wider every day But now I can't deny The white of your eyes It got me feeling the strain Of how I couldn't speak Every time I heard your name is back and rides even lower. I'm with uh, John Taylor from Ural Australia. Now John brings in these Ural sidecars, but he also has an, another bit of a 
a sideline business called Ural of Oz, which is to teach people how to ride sidecars. Now he does use these Urals to do that, but anyone who wants to come and learn to ride a sidecar, then can come to uh, John and he'll teach them how to do it. John, over 20 years ago, I rode a sidecar, one and only time, an old gold wing, and it was pretty terrifying. I'm going to test one of these, so I need to know how to ride it. And uh, so I'm coming here with an open mind, and you're the guy, obviously, to teach me. So it's totally different to a, a motorcycle, I get that. So uh, where do we start? The main difference, Chris, is that in your brain, <clears throat> you have a program that you've developed over a period of time for riding a motorcycle. When you hop on a sidecar, you need a new program and it takes a while to learn it. Okay. And the reason for that difference is that on a solo motorcycle, you're counter steering to go around the corner. You're turning left to go right. Okay. When you get on a sidecar, you have to turn right to go right. And it has to be a direct steering. The other thing about a motorbike sidecar is that most of your braking is in the bike and most of the acceleration is coming from the back wheel of the bike. When you come to a corner like this, uh, you can understand that the bike is being pushed forward by its engine and the sidecar is just along for a freewheeling ride. So when you, when you accelerate, the steering is actually turned to the left, like that. And when you're going the other way, you have the opposite effect. You're going along the road and you want to turn around this way and if you do shut the throttle off, the sidecar will actually roll ahead and it pushes it around the corner this way. With all this advice on board, Chris was keen to jump on the new Ural and give it all a go. Here Chris negotiates a right hand turn by using a little bit of back brake and backing off the throttle. Chris then spent more time trying to master the idiosyncrasies of riding a sidecar. Left hand turns required more throttle, but as the speeds picked up, so did the third wheel. And getting that third wheel up leads us to the next stage of training, which is controlling the machine with that third wheel in the air. Well, it's a bit daunting, um, and John was saying, when you get it up on two wheels, this is to learn how to really I guess balance the vehicle, you know, and uh, the sidecar. You're saying that once you go back to two wheels, the same techniques that you use with counter steering come back into play. So, and it, your brain automatically switches. You don't even think about it. Uh, it's pretty good fun, though. After a little bit more practice, John was happy to jump into the sidecar with Chris, so Chris could find out what it's like to ride with a passenger, which of course is the whole point of having a sidecar. So we've covered the principles of using a sidecar here, but really get some training if you're actually going to operate one of these vehicles from an experienced sidecar operator. Ural of Oz sidecar training is $440 per day and get more information from uralofoz.com.au. starts with an attitude. While others claim to be ahead of the curve, we're already leaning into the next one. We're about setting the precedent year after year and letting the rest play catch up. They ride to keep up with today. We ride to own tomorrow.
call it the XV920R, XV1000 or TR1. This was Yamaha's answer to a question that really not enough people asked. Yamaha already had a little bit of a history of looking to the past. A lot of people wanted them to build a classic 500cc four-stroke single, and they did with the SR500, which really has continued to this day. Not so much in Australia, although you can buy the new SR400, but it was popular in overseas markets. Now, you look at Yamaha's engineers at the time, in 1980 when this was released, it was a pretty forward-thinking bike. This was an era of the universal Japanese motorcycle, the across-the-frame, four-cylinder, air-cooled engine, spindly frame, plenty of horsepower, handling to come second. So to branch out into a V-twin was a pretty bold move in 1980 for Yamaha. I often wondered what sort of uh, sake the, the engineers were drinking at the time. Did they have a picture of a Vincent Rapide up on the wall as a little bit of inspiration? Of course, you know, they weren't going to copy that, but maybe give them the, uh, that inspirational or impetus to, to look to the future. And when you look at some of the design features of this bike, yeah, they weren't exactly cutting edge, but they weren't common in motorcycles of the day. Fully enclosed chain case. That gets me thinking that this bike was a gentleman's tourer. That's what it was aimed at, you know. A bike that was made to do lots of miles. So with that enclosed chain case, the chain could handle that sort of stuff. CV carbs, nice riding position. Nothing spectacular, nothing outstanding, but all in all, a pretty good package. But why didn't it really sell? Was it, did people just not like it or the styling was a bit average? In overseas markets, you could uh, get the uh, XV920R as it was called over there with a little tailpiece and RD350LC inspired graphics. And to me, it looked a lot better than this does. It look, this looks a bit plain. But generally speaking, you know, it had all the hallmarks of a, a bike that was just made to do long distances and, and do it well. Let's just touch on that lack of sales success again for a minute. The competition for this bike, I see it, were, were bikes like the R100 RS, Ducati's Dharma, maybe a Motor Guzzi, Le Mans what, Mark II, Mark III at the time. And it was all about more relaxed high speed touring rather than massive acceleration like some of the Japanese bikes at the time. Now in 1980, this bike got Two Wheels Magazine Bike of the Year, but really, as I said, the sales just, well, they didn't exist really. So it makes me think that at, at that time, the motorcycle sales globally did tank. So I wonder if the bike was just really a victim of that, more so than a victim of a poor design. As a gentleman's tour, I think Yamaha have done a pretty good job with this bike. The 1000cc V twin engine is very lopy in feel, doesn't have a lot of power compared to say a modern bike. And the long travel suspension, it's got air shock on the back, it's really made to ride the bumps well. And it's more towards what I compared it earlier with the BMW R100 RS or Ducati Dharma, it's more towards the, the BMW end, the, the more touring end rather than the sporty. But, this bike does handle pretty good for what it is. And you think, even though it wasn't a big seller, this engine went for many, many years after this bike was discontinued in the XV1000 Cruiser range and had 750cc variants as well, but with shaft drive. So Yamaha really did do a good job when they made this bike and it really is a shame that it didn't sell. If you really want to get into an interesting form of motorcycle racing and build your own super bike, go Electric Superbike Racing, where you can literally build your own bike from the ground up. Cycle Talks ventured down to Winton Raceway in Victoria recently to check out some of the bikes that have been built up for this unique and unusual racing series. 
Now, Danny Ripperton's been around the electric bike scene, the racing scene, for uh, for quite a while now. And uh, Danny, when did you build this bike? I started building it five years ago. Uh, the first the first 12 months was just sourcing parts from around the world and trying to find out uh, what kind of motor to put in it, what kind of batteries to put in it. And I haven't even started building or cutting or welding anything you know, for the first 12 months. Okay. Um, 2010, I actually started putting stuff together because I found motors that I could work with, and you know, so it was a starting point. So, with no electrical background other than whatever you've achieved, you know, or, or learned through motor, being a motor mechanic, it's uh, it's something that people can aspire to do. Something different. Yeah, it's. I mean, you could. You don't have to go to university to learn the stuff that engineers know. You know, it's it's a lot of math, and you know, it helps to have a bit of brains to start with, but. It's all learnable uh, outside the university, so uh, you can get a very good grasp of what happens inside an electric motor just by working with them. This amazing machine called the Voltron has been built by Chris Jones. Now, Chris, tell us a little bit about the machine and uh, and, and why you build it. Sure. Um, so my bike, uh, I've dubbed it Voltron Evo. Uh, Evo partly because it's got an Evo electric motor in okay. there and uh, Evo because it's the next evolution of my first bike um, which was also called Voltron. Um, I built, built an electric bike back in 2011 and uh, had a good, good season with it, had a, had a good race here at Winton in 2011. Um, but I knew from that point I wanted to build a better, faster bike. With a few changes, I'd learnt so much from the first bike, I knew I'd um, have to do some good work on this one. What do you see the future of this series in, in Australia? I think people are going to build better and faster bikes. Um, there will be manufacturers making better, faster bikes, um, but we're not going to see them in Australia for a while yet. And we're impatient, we can't wait. And we have to build our own. Cool. You can catch these bikes and more at the EFXC Championship, Sydney Motorsport Park, November 21 to 23. For more information from fxsuperbikes.com.au.